come quickly, oh, come quickly, everlasting God, come down. Oh, come quickly, oh, come quickly. This is the English translation of the Aramaic word Maranatha. Oh, our Lord, come, come quickly. A greeting Christians exchange with one another to remind them of the blessed hope for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The collect for the first Sunday of Advent in the Book of Common Prayer points to this wonderful hope Christians have in the second coming of Christ. Jesus' exaltation into heaven at the right hand of God the Father is not the end of the story. There's another act uh, still to follow, and that act is that one day he will come again. The Christian understanding from the earliest days was that Christ would return at the end, at the consummation of history. In the last clause of the second paragraph about Jesus Christ, it says that he will come from heaven to judge the living and the dead, the second coming. Do you know, for years I used to say that creed, I knew it by heart. We use this phrase without thinking too much. And it never occurred to me that it meant that Jesus was going to come again. It's actually quite a fundamental part of New Testament belief. It's not just a little appendix at the end. A very high proportion of the chapters of the New Testament contain some other reference to the return of Christ. Jesus himself said, I will come again. I'm going away, but I will come back. People can be very blind on that. It is something we have too often forgotten. And yet it's there running all through the New Testament. That's where the creed gets it from. Jesus promised his, it to his disciples that the day would come when he would return in glory and take his own to himself. There is a need in very many of our Christian communities to renew our awareness of the importance of the second coming, not to indulge in arbitrary speculation, trying to set a date, but to be ready, to be watchful. Because although here we have some of the benefits of what he came to do, we, we can be put right with God and so on, and he's given us his Holy Spirit, but we're only too aware that what we have here and now is imperfect, that, uh, that we're, we're far from perfect in our lives, that this world is far from perfect and so on, and therefore it needs for him to return again to put everything right. We eagerly long for but which has not yet happened in its fullness. This is also one reason why Jews today, as perhaps in other generations, have a problem with the idea that Jesus is the Messiah. The Jews in Jesus' day were looking for the restoration of the kingdom. And that was, that, was a lot, that was an event that was going to take place on a linear line of history. They, they, they divided the, 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 the history into two ages, this age and the age to come. The age to come was the age of the restored kingdom. That's when God would restore the kingdom to Israel. They meant the physical geography of Palestine. The, the Gentiles would become their servants. In Jesus' day, Rome would be overthrown. Uh, Jerusalem would become the capital of the world. God's presence would be restored to the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the righteous dead would be resurrected to participate in this restored kingdom. These are all dynamics of, the, of restoring the kingdom to Israel. And this is what they're looking for. This is what they are hungering for in Jesus' day. Uh, and even in, in Acts 1-6, the disciples meeting with the resurrected Lord say to him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, that, that's their thinking. That's their understanding. And along this, along this line, you see, there's going to come a moment where God is going to intervene, and messianic expectations revolved around that moment. There were various messianic expectations, but they all revolved around that moment when God would bring this age to a close and inaugurate the age to come or restore the kingdom to Israel. It would be a historical event in human history, and things would go on from that the way they have been, except now the kingdom is restored. So that's their understanding. A Jew will often say, you, you say, well, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and they'll say, don't be daft. When the Messiah comes, the Messiah will bring peace. He'll bring pe peace. There will be justice. Jesus comes 
And he starts talking about the kingdom already present, with Rome still in the driver's seat, with nothing changed. Look in the world today, do we see peace? Do we see justice? Uh, obviously we don't. What's going on here, you see? There's the first coming of Christ, but that's only half the picture. And Jesus talks about you know, his parable of the wheat and the weeds. And, and the wheat are the sons of the kingdom, the sons and daughters of the kingdom. The weeds are sown by the evil one. And Jesus says they grow together until the harvest, until the end. Jesus gives an image not of this age, age to come, but of that age to come of the kingdom breaking in. In his life, in ministry, the kingdom has come. The Pharisees ask him on one occasion, when's the kingdom come? Where are the signs? And Jesus said, it's already in your midst. He's already here. When we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, do we really reflect what that means? Of course, the kingdom of God is already at work among us. But we are praying in the Lord's Prayer for the full revelation of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus changes the picture. You might, you might take that, that, that uh, you know, Jewish straight line, and Jesus does this with it. He overlaps it, and the kingdom is inaugurated in his life and ministry, in the incarnation. And now, the kingdom life, you see, the citizens of the kingdom, live right in the midst of the citizens of this age. Or in John's vision, the citizens of New Jerusalem live in the midst of a fallen Babylon world. We know that here and now we live in a, a, a time where good and evil are struggling against each other, where sometimes the bad guys seem to win for a while and so on. Uh, but the return of Christ means that's only temporary. There's going to be a, an ultimate consummation. The kingdom is now, but not yet. It's not fully consummated. And so in that sense, the Jews are right. The Jews are awaiting the Messiah, and so are we. The Messiah is yet to come. You see, we have the first fruits, Paul says. So there's going to be a consummation of the kingdom, and there's also going to be the consummation of this age that it will come to an end. And it's, that, it's around that event that the Second Coming is located. We believe that the one who is coming, the Messiah we're both waiting for, is Jesus, who already has come and who died for us and rose again when he came the first time. The very last word of the New Testament is, Behold, I'm coming quickly. It is surely significant that in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the first three words, Apocalypse Jesu Christu, revelation of Jesus the Messiah. We have the words of the risen Christ, surely I am coming quickly. And we have the response of the visionary St. John, Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. If we think about that last word, we really, our minds can flip right back to the very first word of Scripture, Old Testament. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. So the doctrine of creation is very important. The universe had a beginning, it didn't just happen. The last word of scripture says, the universe is going somewhere. History is not blind chance, random. It's moving to end, to climax, to fulfillment. God is going to bring it all together in his time, in his way. He will deal with evil and he will deal with evil in us, and there will be the age to come where there will be righteousness and peace. It's not something that is just a hope, something wishy-washy. It means that God will act. He's the God who has always acted. He created, he acted in history. Jesus came the first time. Jesus will come the second time and bring it all together, wrap it all up. Exactly how it will be take place, we do not know, but we believe simultaneously throughout the world the return of the Lord will be apparent. It's not something to be spiritualized away. We mean not merely a spiritual coming, we mean actually an event in history. And this is what the second coming is about. The early Christians expected the second coming of Christ to occur very soon in their own lifetime. From one point of view, they were wrong because 2,000 years have passed, the second coming has not yet occurred. But from another point of view, they were not wrong. Even if the second coming of Christ is delayed in clock and calendar time, 
Yet, from a spiritual point of view, it is always near at hand. Does it mean that we should get up every morning and think, is it going to be today that we should spend hours and hours trying to work out when it will happen? Uh, well, no, it doesn't. In Scripture, we are told that the second coming will be as a thief in the night. That is St. Paul's phrase. We're also given certain signs to watch for. I don't think these signs give us the possibility to calculate and predict exactly when the second coming will be. The message of the Bible is that we should always be watchful, always be vigilant and expectant. Even if it were true, and of course no one knows, but even if it were true that Christ is coming tomorrow, he would expect me not to be waiting on the tarmac for him, but to be faithfully about my regular duties. The primary focus is what it means to be a follower of the Lamb now, here, today, and in every age of human history. Luther made a, a very interesting comment. He said, if Christ is going to return tomorrow, today I will plant a tree. <laughs> in other words, what he was saying is that my responsibility here and now is to get on with life and the duties God has given me, which is not sitting down trying to calculate the hour of his return when Jesus said he himself didn't know that, but to get on and be faithful and to live here and now. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. The judgment has set, the books have been opened. How shall we stand in that great day? When every thought and word and action God the righteous judge shall weigh Shall we be found before him wanting Or with our sins all washed He shall come again to judge the living and the dead. One of the most famous pictorial representations in the history of Christian art is the Last Judgment. Perhaps you've seen Michelangelo's presentation of this on the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Many places in Europe has a graphic depiction of the Last Judgment. Jesus is seated on a rainbow, and out of his mouth comes a sword on one side and a lily on the other. He is consigning men and women, sheep and goats, to his right and to his left, to heaven and to hell. The souls going to heaven, carried by the angels in their arms. The damned ones being dragged down to hell by the demons. The idea of judgment is immensely important for the creed and indeed for the Christian faith as a whole. It's a very important idea to understand. He comes to judge the quicken the dead, the living and the dead. Of course there has to be a summing up at the end, a sort of a sorting out of the wheat from the tares or the good from the evil and who is going to be on which side and who has responded to the saving gospel of Christ. God is our judge. God holds us to judgment. It's uh, an affirmation of his judgmental role at the end of time when finally uh, the accounts will be settled. We think of judgment as God sitting on God's throne pronouncing judgment. You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. When we think about judgment, it's usually a negative word for us. This idea of judgment is something that really seems to be a disconnect from modern people. If I say so-and-so is going to be judged today, uh, I tremble because I think, you know, something bad is going to happen. Who wants to go to court? It's a world of litigation. We. Who, who wants to be there and uh, have lawyers arguing and uh, for many people the very idea of going to court uh, they can't sleep the night before or weeks before. We are terrified of judgment most of us. So is this a downer in the creed? Not really. If we go back again to scripture and I think we always must to understand the creed because it's based on scripture we find that the idea of judgment is a positive idea. Throughout the Old Testament God's people are crying out to God Oh God, when are you going to judge? Meaning, when are you going to stand up for us? If you go to the Psalms, the Psalms between roughly 95 and 100 particularly, 
uh, you find that the trees of the field uh, are going to clap their hands because God is coming to judge the world. Now, what do they mean by that? They mean God is coming to put the world to rights, to sort everything out. In the ancient Hebrew world, if society was in a mess, the judge would come and take his seat and sort it out and say who was in the right and who was in the wrong and restore the community to healthy, wholesome, functional life instead of messy, dysfunctional life. And so everyone would, phew, that's all right. We're put back straight again. Now that's the sense of judgment which comes through into the New Testament as well. We have taken it as, you know, God is going to be cross with us, but it's really not like that. It's if somebody is going to come and clean up the mess the question at that point is, are you part of the mess or are you part of the solution, if you like? Look, at Daniel, there's a great judgment scene, and judgment is given on behalf of God's people, over against the oppressors of God's people. The judgment is the time when God sets things right. The righteous, many of whom will have suffered in this world up to now, will be vindicated. The believers will enter fully into the promise. And the wicked, even if they prospered in this world, will finally uh, be judged and condemned. And anyone who is a believer in the power of goodness should be very thankful that there is a judgment. Because without that, life would be such a mockery. When we look at the things that are going on in this world, there are many of them that are so evil. There's no retribution in the sense of some kind of angry, vindictive God, you know, taking out a whip and lashing you to pieces. This isn't about God being harsh or vindictive. You know, when you're in harmony with gravity, you're, you're healthy, you're whole, you're comfortable. And when you step off the edge of a roof, does, does gravity suddenly become wrathful? No, it just keeps on being gravity. When you splat at the bottom of your fall, it sure feels like wrath. <laughs> but gravity's not wrathful. When you step off the edge of the spiritual roof of your relationship with God, does God suddenly become wrathful? No, God keeps on being the holy God. And as you move farther and farther away in your unholiness, you experience the torment of that unholiness, which feels like wrath. And of course, since God is the, is the creator of this entire structure, see, we blame it on God. Well, this is God's wrath. Those in hell, if you like, are not punished by God. They punish themselves. Of course, what the cross re reveals to us is that God grieves over that, that God experiences that torment in God's own being, but never coerces us into restoration, because a coerced restoration is not a loving union. So we're always free to say no, and in that saying no, in that turning of our back on God, in stepping off the edge of that spiritual reality, we experience in our lives the brokenness, the disintegration, the torment, the pain that is the consequence of not being in loving union with God. Christ's judgment is his love, and the standard by which he will judge us is, did we show love? That judgment is not something that is, you know, um, some kind of punitive retribution, but rather it is simply the revelation of our bentness in the presence of that which is perfectly straight. It is the revelation of our brokenness in the presence of that which is perfectly whole. So there will be a final spelling out of the meaning of the lives of all of us before Christ in his presence at the second coming. All of us will be seen in the light of Christ-likeness for which we were created. We were created to be like Jesus. We were created for Christ-likeness. When that perfect Christ-likeness becomes manifest, any un-Christ-likeness un -Christ in us also becomes manifest. A useful way of thinking about it is this. When a doctor makes a diagnosis, he is saying, there is something wrong with you. Let's say you have a, a room full of people who are simply lines, okay? And they are 
sort of wavy. Some of them may be wavier than others, but they're, they're all sort of wavy. But they have identified themselves as straight. And then someone brings a straight edge into that room. And suddenly, all of their crookedness becomes manifest against the reality of the straight edge. Now, the straight edge judges them, but not in some sort of vindictive, punitive sort of way. See, we always, we always take punishment and vindictiveness and retribution with judgment. But the straight edge judges them simply by its reality as a straight edge, and their mentness becomes manifest in the presence of that reality. This is simply about God being realistic and saying, this needs to be done if you are to have salvation. The question, therefore, is, has this been done? There certainly is um, consequences of being found unchristlike. We are seen to be sinners. And that is the judgment. The judgment is basically about whether we have done what is necessary in order to be able to be united with God and to be with Him forever. We have lots of questions as ordinary human beings about the justice of God in doing that. Any human judge sitting in a court of law can only make a decision on the basis of the evidence presented, and the evidence presented will often only be partial. It can only make assumptions about people's motives, and motives can be interpreted in different ways humanly. But this God is the God who understands us through and through. And the thing about the judgment that is such a comfort is God never gets it wrong. Everybody will agree with the rightness of the judgment when it happens. No one will say, oh, it was unfair on me, or this and that happened. No, it will be acknowledged that God is all and in all, and that his judgment is perfect, and shall not the judge of, the, of all the world do right, um, as was said back in the Old Testament. As the Anglican prayer says, he's the God to whom all hearts are open and all desires are known. Nothing is secret or hid from him. So he's the God who can actually understand us almost better, in a sense, than we can understand ourselves. He will judge with perfect justice. So a question that might arise at this point is this. We are sinners. God is righteous. How on earth can a sinner hope to evade judgment at the hands of a righteous God? And that's a question that troubled Martin Luther the great German reformer in the 16th century. He was deeply aware of his own sin and of God's righteousness. So how, he asked, can I ever relate to this God? That's an awesome prospect. We approach that or should approach that with some degree of fear. And he found his answer by reading St. Paul very carefully. And the answer he found was this, that God gives him the righteousness he needs to stand in God's sight as a gift. That's something that he could never hope to achieve, never hope to earn, was being given to him by this gracious and righteous God. And so Luther began to realize that God sees us as we are in Christ, that we are enfolded or shielded or protected by the righteousness which Christ won by his obedience on the cross. And so Luther began to realize that he was able to enter into the presence of God, not because of his own righteousness, for he had none, but rather because of Christ's righteousness, which was given to him as a gift by God because of his faith. So for Luther, the answer was faith. Faith unites us to Christ and allows us to share in his righteousness and thus to enter into God's presence with confidence because of who Christ is and what he has done for all of us. We can go into that divine ultimate court of law with a sense of great confidence, knowing that the end result will be that we are not guilty. In our case, the judge is also our lawyer. We've got the best lawyer in the universe. Afraid of the judgment? No way. In this doctrine, there is a great joy and gratitude at the word judgment because the judge is the one who loves you and has redeemed you 
so that it is a life that's free from the fear of judgment. It's a free from the fear of curse and a fear of damnation. In John chapter 5, verse 24, here's Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, not will have, has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has already passed from death to life. That is very significant. Already passed from death to life and we ask ourselves, how could that be? It's because of the cross. We're only saved by the cross. You have to refer always back to the cross. For the Christian who's justified by faith in that death, the judgment has already taken place because the death of Christ and the righteousness of Christ on that cross covers us. We are understood as being a part of Christ. We are, as Luther would say, under the wings of Christ. We are, as Paul says, reckoned righteous. Or as Genesis says, Abraham was reckoned righteous. We are understood as righteous because we are considered righteous by God because of Christ. And therefore, this is what is called the forensic doctrine of justification. I am under, uh, God declares me righteous. God declares me saved because of the cross. Not because he's judging my life according to all of what I do at the end, but because I have faith in that death, I am covered by that victory. Arise, my soul, arise. She Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And that promise that there is no condemnation is one of the most powerful sheet anchors of the Christian hope. That isn't to say that we can in any way be careless about the way in which we live now. The only way to know that we're not guilty is to have made Jesus Lord and to live under his lordship, uh, to exercise faith in him and to trust fully in him. So when the creed talks about judgment right at the end of time, it is talking about the fact that God is offering salvation to all those who respond to God in faith, who repent and turn away from sin and is asking, have you actually done this? The only thing that separates us from the love of God is our rejection of that love. But if we are trusting fully in Him, then it does mean to say that uh, all our sin is covered, all our wrong motives, that God does recognize and know uh, are forgiven. Uh, and all the wrong deeds that we have done uh, are, are wiped clean. And all the sin of the past is uh, removed from us. So we can face the prospect of that judgment assured that uh, he will come and enter us into eternal life rather than uh, the threat of hell or the threat of ultimate 
judgment. That's a challenge, I think, to all of us to ensure we really have trusted this God who wants us to come and be with him forever. There will still be an examination of the way in which we lived in this life. Uh, Paul T talks to the Corinthians about all appearing before the judgment seat of Christ to receive good or ill according to what we have done in the body. And he's referring to believers there. There will still be an examination of the way in which we have lived before God. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, we notice what Christ says to both of them. I was hungry and thirsty, and you gave me food and drink. Or you did not do that. I was a stranger, you took me into your house. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. This is the final criterion of judgment. Did we show practical, compassionate love to our fellow humans? Christ does not ask at the last judgment, how strictly did you fast? How many prostrations did you make in your prayers? He asks, did you feed the hungry? Did you care for the strangers? Did you look after the sick? So that is the final test of judgment. That's the description of somebody who is a believer and who's carrying out and living the kind of life of a believer. This is the way we should understand the last judgment, not in legalistic categories, but in terms of love. We don't need to go to that eternal judgment with fear if we have our faith firmly rooted in Jesus. I was taking part in a big service in Sunderland, a city in my diocese, last night, and we sang at the end of that service that lovely hymn by Wesley, which finishes up, No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him my living head and clothed with righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Now, when the well-taught Christian looks ahead to God putting the world to rights, the well-taught Christian will say, on the one hand, I am a sinner, I know myself to be a sinner, and so I deserve God's judgment, but because of Jesus and what he's done, there will be no condemnation, there will be judgment, the world will be put to rights and I will be put to rights, but that will be a healing, life-giving thing, because it is the Jesus who knows me and loves me, who is the judge, and through whose death and resurrection, I know that I can stand confident before God. Listen to this doxology from the book of Jude. Unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Father, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Story.